Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second series of uh, the uh, Royal Society of Medicine's webinars um, as part of our series COVID for, top, for health professionals and from health professionals. Once again, can I remind you, if you wish to put questions to our guests today, please use the Q&A button on screen for those. And you can also vote for questions that we will try and answer as we go along using the thumbs up function. So who actually, who is our guest? I'm very delighted to welcome Professor Paul Cosforth, who very recently was the Medical Director of uh, Public Health England and for a time its Chief Executive, and now is Emeritus Medical Director advising the board on a variety of topics, become a very familiar face and voice of PHE in recent months. He's handled Ebola and Novichok, but admitted on his blog this week that nothing has prepared him for COVID, not least because he's had to self-isolate because of a serious medical condition. So, Paul, now, I know from your blog that your motto is keep calm and carry on. <laughs> and you are indeed the very embodiment of that slogan and very good at it, I have to say. But I think it must have been fairly testing in the last few weeks, pun intended. We can't but start with that vexed question of testing. Saturday, The Guardian called it a uh, shambles. And today, no less than Sir John Bell from the lofty heights of Oxford has reported that the antibody tests have not exactly been performing well. So. Take, take us through then um, where you think we are at the moment with this question of testing. Okay, and uh, thank you, uh, Simon. Thank you for asking me to, to join you uh, this afternoon. I'm delighted to, to be here and, and, and I hope that the discussion will be of some help to people. I mean, with testing, there's four or five different elements of the uh, strategy that we've got in place at the moment. The first of those has always been about getting a test into PHE and NHS laboratories that is suitable for testing patients who have a clinical need for testing as part of their diagnosis and treatment. Uh, we did that back in January. We published the protocol for the test, uh, I think on the 23rd of January to be precise, and we've rolled that out uh, across the NHS so that testing is available for patients uh, whenever it's needed for clinical purposes. Uh, that we have a target of getting to 25,000 tests a day. We're, uh, as we speak, up to just below 15,000 now. We were at 10,000 at the end of March and 5,000 a couple of weeks before that. So that part of the programme is up and running. It, it, it's working uh, effectively and well and is always been above, uh, you know, the capacity has always been there to meet the needs for clinical testing of patients. Um, where there's been a lot more noise around and concern in the media and the public domain and so on is uh, the extension of testing for much broader purposes. Uh, so first of all for key staff and NHS staff so that uh, in the first instance NHS staff can uh, get to work uh, if they're self-isolating but don't need to be self-isolating. Uh, and, and that's a really important part of the programme that is up and running now to start off with, but it will uh, need to be boosted uh, much further. And I think we will see that boosting much further very quickly now. We've got it working in a number of different uh, drive-through uh, centres. I think there's 10 now as we speak, but plans to get to 50 of those by the end of the month. Uh, we've got new laboratories in uh, Milton Keynes and then being developed in Alderley Park and in Glasgow to, uh, to process all those uh, samples. And once we've got that up and running uh, even more for NHS staff, that will be an opportunity to get other critical workers back through too. That is uh, an important way of keeping as many people in the workforce uh, and able to work as possible during you know, the time that's uh, obviously critical to get through the, 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 the hump of the, the peak of this wave of infection that's uh, coming to us at the moment. The antibody testing is a really interesting one and quite tricky. There's a, uh, you know, the hope is that that will be suitable for very large scale population testing, the sort of tests that we could get delivered to our homes and uh, test ourselves for antibodies, a bit like a, a pregnancy test. Uh, but as John Bell has said, uh, it's really important that those are uh, accurate as for all of our tests do what we need them to do. Uh, and so far they've been very disappointing in, in passing muster from that point of view. The final two things are, there's population surveillance, which uh, we've just started 
Uh, that's an ELISA test based at our laboratories in Porton. Uh, we're using Sentinel GP practices. We've got 300 across the country working with us who are sending us samples now uh, so that we can test population prevalence from uh, people with uh, similar symptoms but are not obviously COVID-19 or not going through that diagnostic process and also getting samples from hospitals and from, uh, from, from other sources like uh, blood uh, specimens, blood laboratories and so on. Uh, so that will be really important. We don't have any results from that yet. We've uh, had samples coming in over the last week and uh, they're obviously being an analyzed and then we'll need to be uh, we'll need to do some proper science behind that to understand the implications uh, that's the fourth piece and the final piece is the secretary of state really wanting now to build a, a large diagnostic capacity in this country more than we've had before which is uh, where one or two other countries have had a bit of an advantage over us, Germany in particular, where they've had far more, uh, a far stronger base in the diagnostics industry, which is why they've been able to uh, test more at an earlier stage than we have. So that's a sort of overview of where we're at with testing. I mean, I mean, there's all sorts of, of things. That, let's start with the, the fifth pillar that you mentioned there. Um, the use, you know, that we, we haven't got the same diagnostic industry as, we, uh, as Germany does. Um, and the same number of testing centers. I think we've centralized ours, whereas they devolved theirs. But where, how, where are these centers going to come from then for the, the fifth bit of the pillar? I mean, at least 20 universities are actively involved in chasing this now. Um, but as John Bell said, it seems not to be working. How are we going to get out of that dilemma? Well, that's the work that is being coordinated by the Office for Life Sciences along with DHSC to bring all those uh, universities uh, and other commercial partners in to help with uh, the uh, efforts on the wider uh, antigen testing in the first instance. Yeah. And that There's no reason why that can't work and can't develop and that I would expect us to see uh, ramp up quickly. The emphasis to start off with has been something called the Thermo Fisher test uh, regime, which is the one that is being used for the drive-throughs and those three big hub laboratories. Uh, those are coming on stream now and, 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 and we are seeing uh, increases in the numbers of tests available through those uh, systems. The wider piece is a piece of coordination, as I say, uh, that needs to be done and is being done through the Office for Life Sciences and, and others, but it's not the antibody testing. That's a different yeah. strand of the okay. programme. Yeah. And, um, but on the antigen testing, there's still, yeah. I can speak from a, quite a lot of uh, questions being asked, um, a belief that if we could get this sorted as quickly as possible, this would have a major impact on the NHS workforce, uh, which is obviously the, the, the high priority at the moment. Is that, is that accurate or too simplistic? Well, it will have an impact. Of course it will. The latest figures I've seen from the monitoring suggest that around 5% of doctors, maybe 8% or so, somewhere around those sort of figures uh, of, of, of nurses uh, are, are, are off work because of COVID-19. And of course, the intention is to use testing to enable as many people to come back to work as possible. So of course, it will have an impact. There's a bit of a caution, of course, because there's a sort of assumption that if you've got symptoms, you have a COVID test, it's negative, you can go back to work. But of course, we don't actually want anybody with respiratory symptoms, whether it's due to COVID-19 or, or another respiratory uh, infection, at work on uh, caring for you know, vulnerable patients, either with COVID-19 or with other uh, diseases. So uh, the, 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 there is a, a, you know, a, a narrative around this which suggests that there'll be uh, you know, many people who could just come back to work. We need to target it very carefully and effectively, but we need to urgently ramp up the numbers to make sure uh, that we're getting as many people back in to work as possible. And that is uh, in the process. It's early days. We wish it was further on. I certainly wish it was further on than it is, uh, but it is complex. And uh, you know, actually, it's quite a remarkable uh, program that's being put in place really very quickly by any objective measures. But of course, with the uh, scenario that we're facing, we all want to do that more quickly. True, but people are also pointing out, you've already mentioned Germany, but we are testing as a proportion of our population significantly, substantially less than both France and Italy, once, twice, once, four times us. Um, how come we have managed to lag behind so much? 
Well, what we focused on is the testing that's needed clinically for patients. It's interesting. I mean, we can you know, look at a number of different countries and there are countries we've got plenty to learn from. Of course, there will be. I was talking with colleagues in, in South Korea this morning about their testing uh, regime and their whole uh, effort around, uh, uh, around COVID-19. They, you may remember, hit their peak in mid-February. They have peak as the numbers have come down. They're now running at about 100 cases a day and have been for, for some uh, time now. Their testing capacity is actually around 15,000, which is where ours is and it's never been higher than that the most they've uh, the absolute maximum is around 20 but they run at a, around 15,000 a day focusing on antigen tests which is obviously where we've been because those are the reliable ones uh, focusing obviously on patients and then high risk uh, others so we're not that dissimilar from a number of different places and I think the suggestion that if only we got the testing right we'd have sorted COVID-19 is just not right. Obviously, it's an absolutely core part of the strategy to try and get through the next uh, few weeks and, and months um, with as little impact on the NHS, on the population, uh, on everything we do as possible. So I wouldn't want to underplay the importance of testing, but we do need to be accurate about it. Antigen tests for patients, critically important. It's always been in place uh, and within the capacity has, has, has been there to do what's needed on that. Uh, we're now building up on the staff testing that will extend to critical workers. This figure of 100,000 tests a day capacity by the end of April, that looks as if it should be uh, deliverable with all the uh, work that's being uh, done by ourselves, by DHSC by the Office for Life Sciences, bringing in uh, the universities and private industry. And of course, in our own programme, uh, we're getting to the 25,000 tests with the NHS by a private partnership with Roche. So uh, we've you know, been very active in this space to make sure that we've got everything that we possibly uh, can do in place to do this as quickly as possible. OK, some people are asking, is that my wife in the background and is she better? I'm very pleased to say she's very much better. Um, so um, going, going on with that, so we've had a couple of very specific questions actually, I hope you'll be here. First of all, it's from a surgeon, Dan, who uh, wants to know about, should we be testing elective patients for, if, assuming there is still elective surgery going on, of course, but should we be testing them now um, before operation? It's a good question, and, and, and to be honest, if we go down too many very specific questions, I'm unlikely to have all the answers uh, for you. We've got you know, teams of people who, who work on these, but the, the clinical criteria for testing at the moment don't include general screening of all patients unless there is a, a need uh, because there's you know, a, a clinical reason to do so, either they've got symptoms or, 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 or other similar uh, uh, issues. And the, the problem with using antigen testing as a screening test is, of course, that uh, the uh, test will be negative unless you've actually got symptoms. So you can be in the incubation period or perhaps in the 24 hours before uh, symptoms appear. So there is that caveat, but um, uh, it's not really... Uh, useful as a general screening test. The hope is, of course, that the antibody, the serology test will work um, better as a, a means of telling whether people have had infection, the antigen ones for active infection, but we're not advising using them for screening purposes for everyone as yet. But of course, we're uh, monitoring that and it's a suggestion I will uh, take back and check where we're at with that. Okay, thanks very much. And then also, I, again, this may well be too technical, but I have been asked about the differences between the different routes for doing the antigen test, oropharyngeal, tracheal, or nasopharyngeal. Um, did your PhD have views on that? Uh, I don't know the details of the different the routes of doing the test. Uh, <laughs> there's a whole load of okay. clinical protocols uh, 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 around it. So I know more about the different types of laboratory machines and closed systems and open systems and where you get reagents from and all of that. Have, so a, again, I can, uh, I can come back on that if that would be helpful. We do have people. a high powered audience, Paul. At the RSA. I know. Well, we have, a, we have an audience that's delivering care to patients on the front line and I've full of respect and admiration. My role is more on the epidemiological and overarching response uh, side and trying to make sure that all the support that's required uh, is provided to people who are doing uh, that uh, vital role. Okay, now Martin has been asking about 
Um, are you intending to change the current policies on contact tracing? Um, so contact tracing at this stage is not going to be the most effective or most helpful thing to do because we're in a position why. of widespread community transmission where mm. contact tracing specifically uh, in the way that we did at the early uh, as um, part of the pandemic uh, would be most helpful. So contact tracing, the real role for in-depth contact tracing right at the outset of a pandemic like this when you're trying to identify every possible case and stop and delay spread as much as you can so that you can get everything in place in order to be able to manage the wave of the pandemic whatever is to follow so robust contact tracing at the outset uh, and i think it's quite conceivable that we end up in a position when we start to come out of the wave of the pandemic and the numbers come down where one of the sort of exit strategies that that that, that, that is uh, possibly going to be in front of us is going to be very robust contact tracing uh, again. So uh, there's certainly a lot of work going on at the moment to look at different ways of scaling up contact tracing and there's a development of an, of an app that you've probably heard of that will uh, use uh, different systems hopefully to be able to automatically identify who people's contacts are so that we can uh, work on that basis rather than relying on uh, small numbers of individuals who can phone people up and go through uh, all the contacts that they've had in the previous mm. 10 days or so. So uh, we will need to, towards the end of uh, the current wave, think about uh, how we're going to uh, use contact tracing to help bring the numbers right down. But at, at the moment, as the numbers are massively increasing uh, in the way that they are at the moment, contact tracing isn't the core strategy. It's the social distancing is much more important as a as a strategy to reduce spread okay and others are asking also about modeling which obviously you, public health england plays a major part in yeah. and actually this is a you know a question that does fascinate me going back to neil ferguson obviously a central figure in this but not the only one but someone's pointed out his model uh, assumed that we that were 2.7 percent of us were infected uh, with uh, with COVID, COVID, um, and I must admit, I myself am a bit baffled about where did that figure come from. Was that from a PHE figure? I don't know the source of that precise figure. What I would okay. say is what the modelling suggests at the moment is that the if you remember the R naught, the R naught is the critically important number here, and the R naught, if it's above one, it means that. For every person who's infected, they're infecting more than one other person. If it's below one, for every person that's infected, uh, mm. it's infecting, you're infecting less than one other person on average. And that's when the uh, epidemic passes its peak and starts coming down mm. again. Now, with all the social distancing measures that we've got in place at the moment, if they are working as we think they are working, then the R naught should be below one. Uh, we'll mm -hmm. see over coming weeks whether that absolutely turns out to be the case. But the signs at the moment with the increases in cases and in uh, deaths and, and, and some of the consequences, they're roughly linear. And they are going up, but they're not going up quite as exponentially as you would expect if we had uh, continued widespread transmission with the R0 being a two to three where it was to start off with. So I think there's early signs that we can be hopeful that we will see a, a plateauing over the next small number of, of weeks. That's the key bit for modelling uh, from the point of view at the moment. And it needs to stay well down for us to get the numbers down quickly. So if we can keep the R naught and get it to around 0 0.6 or less, then we get the numbers coming down really rapidly. If the R naught hovers at around 1, then it takes many weeks and several months to gradually reduce the numbers. And, and, and so all the efforts in many ways, policy-wise at the moment, are how do we get the R naught as low as possible and sustain it at that low level for as long as possible. I, I and so that's, that's the key bit of modelling at the moment. I mean, I think even, even psychiatrists have got that one. Well, I think we can understand that one. But what we what found going back to my own epidemiological background, I still just want to go back to the to the question I was asking, which is, what where are we in terms of what do you think 
is the estimate now of the rate of infection in the population. We hear, we know from China, it was ended up remarkably low. We're hearing from France, it may be as little as 3%. What, what do you think in for the UK? You must be considering this a, a lot and you must have some sources of information. You mentioned some earlier on, but if you could just elaborate that slightly. So I have no specialist uh, access to knowledge on this that's over and above many other people's. But if you want my best guess, I would say it's probably below 10 percent. But I don't I don't know for sure. And, 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 and uh, you know, the, the key will be to see what the outcome of one of those pillars of the testing strategy turns out to be, which is our epidemiological surveillance, our population based surveillance. That's now up and running. Uh, so we should get some. Um, some really more um, uh, definitive uh, estimates coming through from that system over overcoming uh, well, well, of course, that will number be of weeks. Four weeks behind, won't it? That will that will not be a picture of now. It'll be a picture of what it was four weeks ago. Is Why four right? weeks? Um, no, it, well, if, it, we're it, using it, an antibody, if we're using the antibody. No, no, no. Sorry, that's not an. Uh, so. Ah. Sorry, yes. No, okay. you're right. It is an antibody test. It's the ELISA test as yeah. opposed to the, the mass testing. Uh, so it will be about two weeks behind. Oh, OK. Um, but that should tell us what the prevalence is uh, from, from that sort of okay. period. It needs proper assessment, proper analysis, of course. But I think it's that specific UK figure that we need to be able to work on what the zero prevalence is across the UK. But as you say, the indications from other countries is that it, it may well be quite low. Mm. And how does that then affect lots of people are now saying, tell us about the exit strategy or strategies, plural, I suspect it is. But where, where are PHE sitting at the moment on exit strategy, given the data you've just, uh, let's assume your, your, your assumptions are reasonably accurate. Yeah. So, of course, the single most important thing at the moment is to damp down the rise of infections, to build NHS capacity at the same time, which is uh, going on as we speak, and you'll all be aware of that, so that at the peak of this um, pandemic wave that we're uh, in at the moment, we remain within the capacity of the NHS to be able to treat, to ventilate, and uh, to uh, provide all the care that's that's needed and then come down the other side. The question then is, uh, what are the criteria and how do you come out of the uh, very uh, you know, restrictive uh, system that we're in at the moment about uh, the social distancing and so on? And there's a number of different scenarios to that. Again, I, I'm afraid I might not uh, give you more than the speculation that is rife at the moment, but you know the sort of uh, scenarios where you gradually lift social restrictions whilst putting in place a very robust testing and contact tracing uh, regime. So you, you identify everybody uh, that you can with the infection. You do the self-isolation, the contact tracing for all of their contacts whilst gradually lifting some of the social distancing measures at the same time. That's one possible strategy. Another one would say we lift the measures and we observe what happens in terms of infection across the country. Again, that would need uh, the testing uh, that we've uh, got in place and we're now uh, putting in place even further. But you may come to circumstances where uh, the uh, infection comes back up again, where the R0 goes back up above one, uh, and we have to reintroduce some of the restrictions uh, to get that R0 below one again. And we may be in a, a, a cycle of doing those. Uh, it's early to say, and there's a lot of work going on, obviously, uh, amongst the scientific advisory committees with CMO and government chief scientific advisor to look at what those different scenarios might be. But until we know exactly what the scenario is as we come out of this, what happens in terms of the r naught? what happens in terms of uh, the zero prevalence across the country, whether there are specific groups that might be of a particular uh, difficulty, either because there's more spread or more zero prevalence, or because you know, we know about people who are vulnerable and, and where the most vulnerable uh, uh, individuals are, then it's very difficult to say exactly what the exit strategy will need to be. But that, as much clarity as we can uh, get over the next two to three weeks, I think will be critically important. And several people, as part of the exit strategy, are also asking about schools 
You probably yeah. saw Russell Viner's paper in The Lancet this morning, widely reported. Um, oh, the question has disappeared now, but anyway, so I can't remember who asked it. But basically saying, what, what do you think about the possibility of opening the schools, you know, before September? And the concern there was, but we know that some children are super spreaders. Would it be wise to do that? Well, I think there's two sides to the schools issue, isn't there? One is that children are... Uh, you know, the, the risks of children getting severe complications from COVID-19 are much, much less than uh, the rest of the population, particularly older people and vulnerable people, uh, and, and that the closing of schools has a very significant impact on children for their social well-being, their health um, and also, of course, vulnerable children in particular, some of whom uh, are safer being at school than they are not being at school. So there's a really difficult balance, I think, with the school's question. In my head, uh, as we look at, and, and, and sorry, the, the other issue there is the extent to which schools contribute to the spread uh, of the virus. And obviously, that was a significant issue that led to schools being closed in, in the first place. Um, in my head, as we lift social restrictions, I think lifting school closures needs to be one of the things that we consider sooner rather than later to get children at least back to a semblance of normality as quickly as possible for all the obvious reasons around that. But we need to keep a real eye on how spread uh, does occur in schools both here and in other countries to get that right. So I don't have a perfect answer to you. It's a really difficult balance uh, there'll be scientific advice as to exactly what the contribution of schools is to uh, the spread of infection. And it's relatively small, but it's not insignificant. Uh, and then ultimately, there's a, a political and policy decision as to uh, how to, to stage yeah. this based on the, on the, on the scientific I, advice that we give. I, I rather liked Robert Dingwall's co comment this morning, who said there would be more danger from all the parents crowding around the school gates at the beginning and end of the school day than in the school itself which I think is probably reasonably accurate, actually. Well, uh, I think what is absolutely clear is that as we come out of uh, restrictions at the point we do, we will absolutely need to retain much of the social distancing advice. So, I mean, I haven't thought through the detail of the school gate issue, um, but people retaining that distance of two metres apart to reduce spread. Mm. Now, in the early days, as we begin to loosen some of the restrictions, we will have to push very hard on responsible behaviour around a, a whole range of things and think about how we do that in a, in a sensible, phased and managed fashion. Yeah, I mean, there are doubts as to how long we can sustain that, but that's a, a final thing. And just the very last question, and that last is saying, to, to the outsider, it looks a very complicated system we have. We have you, we have various other arms length bodies, we have various government departments, Downing Street, scientific communities, et cetera, et cetera. And you're very senior in, in this hierarchy. How do you think it's working as a system? Do you think we're organized now well to, to make the right decisions? Well, I, I'm always a cup half full person rather than a cup <laughs> half empty person. I can always see ways that we could do things better. But I am actually, with every uh, crisis or issue that I'm involved in from Novichok, Ebola back in 2013-14, this one is obviously bigger than uh, any of those. Uh, I'm always amazed at how government does manage to come together, the strength of the civil service in supporting that and making it happen, the strength of relationships between Public Health England, NHS England, the Department of Health and Social Care, the links into the Cabinet office and, and, and number 10 and so on, it does actually work uh, as a really strong machine. Of course, there are tensions. Of course, there are, are views when uh, you know, some people think there's a, an obvious thing we should be doing and others uh, and the scientific advice may not support it or, or there's things that we need to, to think about carefully. But if you want my overall view, I, th I think we have a, a remarkable system. Uh, of course, there's an awful lot more that we need to do uh, to get through the other side of this. And uh, the last thing we can ever be, and particularly at the moment, is complacent that we're getting uh, everything right. So absolute uh, constant focus monitoring day to day. Are we doing the right thing? Are we sure we're doing the right thing? What's the latest piece of evidence that help us make sure of that? What are the communications messages that we need to give? What are the public behaviours we need to change? What are the issues about distribution, testing, personal protective equipment and so on and getting all of those right. Um, but as a system as a whole, um, I think we're, we're, we're quite, uh, quite lucky in, in many ways. 
Okay, Paul. I think we now need our own exit strategy from, uh, from this webinar. So I thank you very, very much for, for joining us. Can I remind uh, the audience that we will be back this coming Thursday at the same time, not quite the same time, at 12.15, where our guest will be uh, Professor Hugh Montgomery, um, who is the Chair of Intensive Care at UCL and the Critical Care Consultant at the Whittington. Could hardly be more topical if we had tried, which in fact we didn't, but he will be here on Thursday. And for those who want a slightly less hurried and different format, I will be interviewing tomorrow Evan Davis in our In Conversation series. Uh, that will be at seven o'clock, so time to sit down with a glass of wine. And that will be, again, about the economic short and long-term forecasts around COVID. Uh, but hopefully he will also reveal some stories of the monstrous ego of his fellow journalists. He has promised me he will do that. So join us again uh, tomorrow at seven and then Wednesday at 12.15. So thank you very much, Paul, um, for again, sharing the insights from Public Health England and we wish you luck. So it's a uh, goodbye from us at the RSM. And once again, the words of Sergeant Pete Esterhouse, look him up if you don't know, um, always uh, end up and say, just be careful out there and we'll see you again. Thank you very much. Thanks, Simon.